Hello and welcome. So this time we're going to be talking about functions. So we already had a little bit of a look at functions before. We've seen the start and the update ones. And the idea behind functions is that they give us a, a reusable block. Uh, and it's a, it's a way that we can create these to make it so we're having to write the same code actually less often. Um, so we're not duplicating code as much, which means less potential for errors. Also frees up time for making the rest of the project. Um, we're not spending it having to do a lot of duplication, a lot of repetitive stuff there. So what we're going to do is, as always, I'm going to set up the typical folders that I'm going to be making use of. Uh, so my scripts and materials. I'm going to set up a plane that will be my ground. And I'm also going to set up a sphere, which I'm going to use. It's going to be a ball. Uh, under materials, let's then get some materials set up, so one for the ground, uh, which make the ground like a darkish green. That works. Not that dark, but it still works. Uh, and then we'll also set up a material for the wall. Uh, I just like to prefix my, one of the things you'll notice is I prefix the materials with uh, Matt. And the reason I do that is just if I'm searching, uh, I often find that makes it a little bit quicker and can find the materials a little bit easier then. Uh, so that's cool. We've got our ground, we've got our ball. And so let's look at the script. So I'm going to set up a script that its job is going to be uh, to, to make this bounce. So it's going to be a bounce script. And then I need to attach that onto the ball. Now that it's compiled, it'll be able to attach it. So cool, I've got my bounce script. So let's initially look at setting this up uh, where what it's going to do is all, all it's going to do is just make, make the ball bounce. Uh, Ave. And there's a lot of different ways we could actually be doing this. We could be doing this via maths. Uh, that's one approach for it, and and by maths I mean using something like a sine or cosine function uh, that actually oscillates, so we could be using that. Uh, I'm actually going to go a slightly different approach to what I'd normally use for this, and I'm going to use an animation curve. Uh, so there's something that we haven't uh, made, we haven't seen, we haven't really worked with a huge amount yet. Um, if you have looked at some of the uh, dev deep dive videos, then you would have seen me using them there. But I want to introduce them here um, because animation curves, I think, are an incredibly powerful, incredibly helpful thing. So let's take a look at what we can do here. So we're going to have animation curve, and this is going to be my bounce curve. So if we think about what we want to be able to control with the process of bouncing. So I need to be able to control the height of the bouncing. That's one key thing. So I'm going to need a float for my bounce height. And let's make it that initially, let's go for one meter. So I've got the, so the height, that's gonna be part of it. Uh, the other thing there as part of the bouncing is I might want to control how fast it's bouncing. So there's a lot of different ways that I could set this up. So how I usually go about this is it's down to what is going to make it easiest for me to visualize this. Because there's kind of two main approaches. So I could be specifying the number of bounces per second. So there I'm kind of talking about the frequency of bouncing, so bounces per second. Or I could specify how long it takes for it to do one full loop. So going up, coming back down. So that, that I could actually, um, you know, that's the, the kind of the period of it then, the, the, the length of a single cycle uh, is what we're talking about there. So in terms of which ones I use, it's down to what makes it easiest for me to visualize it. 
and in terms of what make what's going to be easiest for me to tune and adjust this. So I think in this case, being able to control that time for a full bounce is going to be the easiest one to work with. Because if I decrease that, it'll mean it bounces faster. If I increase it, it means it bounces slower. So that's going to mean I need a bounce period. So I want to say that it's going to take it one second initially to do this. Uh, so that means every second I want it to do a full bounce. So okay, if we think I've got my height, I've got my period, I've got the curve. Cool. Let's have a bit of a look at what these animation curves look like though, so we can get a sense of how we actually can set this up. So animation curves appear here, I can click on them, and then I can customize it. You can see down the bottom here, I've got a bunch of different things. And so I can just click on these, see what they look like. So this one is, is a common one that I often use. It eases out and then it eases uh, back in. So it's a, it slows down at these points. So it has a section that's largely linear in the middle, uh, but then it has a slow transition into that and a slow transition out of that. So it means we would get a bit of, if we use something that's similar shape to that, we would get a bit of a slowdown at the beginning at the end, which could look really quite good. Um, but this wouldn't, you know, the curve needs to bring it back to its original point. So what I can do is I can double click and add in another point and I can actually manually edit that. So I want it to be exactly in the middle and I want it to be at one. And then this point here, I can edit that and I want that to be at zero. And then when I click on these points, you can see just these little handles that appear here and that allows you to change uh, the slope there. So I can adjust it like that. So what this would do is the ball's going to mount up. As it's getting near the top, it'll start to slow down and then it will start to speed up. And then it hits near the bottom and then slows down again. So that looks pretty good. Uh, I could always, if I wanted it to uh, you know, change that, I can easily just be changing the shape of this. I could add in extra points. And you'll see I've intentionally kept it that the input, so the horizontal or x-axis is our input, uh, the vertical axis is our output. So I've kept it between zero and one because that works really nicely for being able to scale things uh, by it. So it works really well for stuff like of that. So it looks pretty good. Uh, how we then use that in code. And we're going to be, we are tracking in a bunch of new things here, um, but we're going to talk through each one of them and we're going to assemble this piece by piece. So we haven't actually set up a new function yet and that's okay. So what we're going to do is, well, okay. So I've got this thing and we think about it. I've got this curve that I need to provide an input that goes from zero to one. And I want this to be, I guess, going with time. That makes sense. So that actually tells me other information. It means I need to keep track of time. So, okay. Well, that's not something I need the user to mess with. So I don't need to make that public. I can have up here float uh, bounce time. And it would make sense to start that at zero. So it's starting at the very uh, beginning there. So then in update, well, I need to know, because update runs every frame. So I need to know how long it's been since the last frame. And I can actually find that out. So if we go for similar to how we've written this before, a more verbose version of this, I could say bounce time is equal to bounce time plus time dot delta time. So delta, when we refer to delta and then some quantity, we're meaning the change in that quantity. So a delta position would be a change in position. A delta speed would be a change in speed. 
delta time is the change in time. And in this case, it's the change in time since the last frame. So since the last time update ran. So bounce time is now just going to continually move up. Now this is one way of writing this. So update the bounce time. That is one way. So this is version one, and this is the verbose version. The more concise version of this, update the bounce time. This is version two, concise version. How this would look is bounce time plus equals time dot delta time. So these two are equivalent. They do exactly the same thing. The main difference with this second one is just that it's a bit of a shorter one to write. So I'm going to comment out this first one because we're just going to stick with this second one. And from now on, I'm going to tend to be writing these versions of this. Um, they're equivalent, but this is just a shorter way of writing it. So less typing, less potential for errors. So I'm updating the time, call. So it'll continually increase. It'll always be going up every single frame. So I could feed that into my animation curve. So the way these animation curves work is you say bounce curve dot evaluate and you give it an input value. So the input value uh, in this case would be, for example, our bounce time. And then what we can do from this is curve output. So we're getting the current value of the bounce curve. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to debug log this. Because again, going back to those sort of principles of we don't want to be writing too much code before we then go and check it. We want to make sure we're regularly checking our code. So we've written that, we want to come back to Unity, and then we want to test that and see what's actually happening. So if I run this, we're not expecting it to move. But we see this counts up, and we can see the values that we get out and we can stop this and we can see it counted up and up hit one and then came back down to zero and then it's just continuing to output zero. So it did one cycle. We're not getting multiple cycles out of it. So if we want to get multiple cycles out of it, there are a few different ways of how we could approach this. And this is something where if you want to uh, challenge yourself a little bit, you could pause at this point and have a bit of a think about, well, what are some of the ways you can think of to have this uh, be constrained? Because that's, the problem is, is I need it to be constrained within that zero to one range. So if you want, pause now and then unpause when you're ready to see a couple of different ways of approaching this. Okay, so method one to keep bounce time in range. So method one for this uh, is what I could do is if bounce time is greater than bounce period, then bounce time minus equals bounce period. The reason I do minus equals is so if we've uh, gone a little bit over the bounce period, we preserve that little bit extra. Um, so it should keep the timing a bit more consistent. If I was just resetting it to zero, uh, and actually I could do a greater than or equal to, if I was doing just setting it to zero, I would be potentially not necessarily, but potentially introducing a slight uh, bit of uh, time delay in there. I'd be dropping away some of the time. So this is method one. We're checking if it's greater than or equal to the bounce period. And if it is, then we subtract it. Now, important thing here is evaluate 
our input here, we're trying to keep it so that our input is between zero and one. But I'm checking against bounce period here. Now at the moment, bounce period is one. I actually need to make sure that I divide by bounce period here. If I don't, then as soon as my bounce period becomes something other than one, uh, it's not going to be working properly. It's going to introduce errors. So we want to make sure we're checking uh, the that it's divided by it because that will make it that it's always because we're keeping it to be zero to bounce time oh sorry zero to bounce period this will mean we're always then dividing by something that is between zero up to bounce period which means this value will always be zero to one so okay that's method one for doing it uh, completely fine for using that method absolutely no issues with doing that there's other methods we could use. So the other method that we've got for keeping it in range, which before we implement it, let's actually test uh, what's happening here with this, just so we can see. And I'm going to turn off collapse because uh, we're kind of going to need that so that it actually is working properly. So we can see it goes up and down and it's continuing to oscillate between those, which is good. So we've got another approach. And this uses an operator that you might not have seen so far. So this one is using the modulus operator. So this one we would say bounce time percent equals bounce period. So the modulus operator is something that what it does is it returns the remainder. So it will divide bounce time by the bounce period and it essentially it removes the uh, an integer number of times that this goes into it. So if bounce time was 1.1, we would get back 0.1 uh, with a bounce period of one. If bounce period was two, and so we did 1.1 modulus two, we get back 1.1 because it doesn't, there's not, there's, it goes into it zero amount of times and the remainder is 1.1. So modulus gives us the remainder. So let's test with that and see what that does. Because so that's an even simpler line of code for us to write. So we run that and yep, it's oscillating up and down the way we want. So perfect. So now we have something where the time is increasing we're keeping it bounded within the range that we need. We've got our output here from the curve. So now we can relocate the sphere. So the way I have to go about doing this is a little bit odd. Uh, so my transform.position is what I'm changing. Now with the stuff I've seen before, we might be thinking, well, I can just do transform position Y and that is equal to, you know, whatever I want it to be. So maybe curve output, but that's not a thing we can do. We can read from transform.position.y, but we can't actually directly set it. Uh, we can only pass it in an entirely new position. So what we would have to do is our transform.position that that is equal to a new vector three. So we can create variables just like this at this point. So we can say it's a new vector three and it's gonna be at zero, it's gonna be at curve output and zero. And you know, we know we've got a, a height that we're able to be moving. So we want to change that to multiplied by bounce height. So, okay, let's, let's take a look at that. Let's see how that works. Now, there are some issues with this. It's going to mean it doesn't have exactly the behavior we want. So I'm going to run it and then we're going to see what those issues are.
Now it is bouncing, which is cool. But what happens if I move it over here? Oh, okay, it jumps back. And that's because I'm overriding every part of its position. I'm not moving it based upon where it started. I am changing it based upon, nope, I'm forcing it to this exact location. So this is where what I want to often do is factor three, start position or initial position. Initial position, and this is where the start function comes in handy. My initial position is equal to my transform position. So what I'm doing is store my initial location. Because then down here, this, I can say, well, my transform position is equal to my initial position plus this offset. Update our position. Now I can relocate this wherever I want in the world. Uh, wherever it starts, it can then move it from there. So I can place this here, and then it will just bounce very happily there. Uh, if I want to change the height, I can see that works nicely. If I make it that it slows down, then I can make it again slower bouncing. So all of that is working quite nicely. Uh, and I'm going to position this here because I'm going to set up a couple of different ones just so we can see the impact of uh, what actually happens with different values for these. So I'm going to make it that the one here that is, this is going to be uh, west, this one's going to be south and then we've got uh, this one will be east good and then this one will be north so let's just adjust a bunch of different settings for these. So the north one, I'm going to leave at default. South one, I'm going to let it bounce higher. East, I'm going to let it bounce slower. So, and then the west one, I'm going to make it a shorter bounce, uh, but at a faster rate. So we should then have four ones, all bouncing slightly differently. Uh, which is what we've got. So easy way of setting up things for being able to make them bounce and move around. Um, and we've seen you know, some different stuff with these initial functions here, using start to track initial information. And that's a common usage of it, is doing using it for doing some setup stuff, using it for storing some initial bits of info. And then we've seen update setting up all of these uh, things in terms of using time delta, delta time, using the bounce period with the modulus to keep it to within that range, and then making use of our animation curves. So this is already starting to get a bit long. And so functions, we often want to break them up. We don't want to have functions get too ridiculous in length. I did work on a project that when I started on the project, it had a single function that that function was 10,000 lines long, which to give context, 10,000 lines, you're usually looking at about uh, 65 lines per page if you print out the code at a standard size. So we are talking something that was about 150, yeah, about 150 pages worth. Uh, so about a third of a ream of paper was one function. And it was fine because, you know, it was the main update function for literally every humanoid character. Uh, it was, a f no one wanted to have to change anything in that. I, at some points had to, and they needed to send in search parties afterwards. Uh, 
So we don't want to have functions get ridiculously long. It gets really difficult for maintaining. It makes it easier to have errors. So we want to be able to keep them more constrained. So how we can do that is we can set up our own functions. So what I could be doing here is, because we can see the sort of pattern our functions tend to follow here. So I could be setting up one which is form bounce. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set up two ones. I'm going to set up perform bounce verbose and there'll be a perform bounce concise. Because then I'm going to move these bits of code depending upon their style into the different ones. So this one goes into the verbose one. This just means that it will make it a little bit easier if you want to try out the different ones. So we've got this. So that's those ones in there. Now I'm going to bring these over. And what we'll have is we'll have two completely separate methods or functions. And this is the thing you'll, you'll often, you'll hear functions sometimes referred to as methods. Uh, largely there's not a different languages sometimes use different namings for the things. Um, but if a function or method, uh, both are typically referring to the same thing, they're referring to a packaged up set of code. So here we go, I've got two functions. So a function has always a three, three key things that must always be there. So one is a name. Functions always have to have a name. So this function's called perform bounce verbose. We also have perform bounce concise. Functions also have to indicate whether they give information back. You'll notice each one of these has void before it. That means these functions cannot give any information back. It is not possible for them to do that. But we've seen things like this evaluate. Evaluate is a function. Evaluate can give information back. And we can see if we mouse over the tooltip, it has float. So where, rather than having void, it has float there because that allows it to give information back. So functions have a name. They have an indication of what they give back. So either they give back nothing or they give back a particular type of value. Functions can also take information in something we call parameters or arguments. Because we've seen that here, evaluate is taking in a parameter. It's taking in a zero to one value. These ones, these are empty. That means they cannot take information in. What that means is if I tried to write something like this, so perform bounce verbose, and I tried to pass in, you know, 567, it's going to get angry at me. And it's specifically going to say, no version of it takes an argument. No version of it takes one argument there. I could make it even grumpier at me. And let's try and say, uh, this is returning the meaning of life, uh, which I'm going to say the meaning of life is an integer. Uh, now it's still only giving me that error, but say I got rid of this it's still going to be grumpy at me because it's going to say cannot implicitly convert. And this is one of those cases where the error messages are not great because it thinks I'm trying to convert a void to a float, uh, which is kind of what I'm trying, what I'm doing there. Um, but it's its way of saying, Hey, you're using this thing that says it doesn't return anything and you're asking it to return something. So perform bounce verbose. I'm going to comment that out but I am going to put perform bounce concise. So call run execute uh, function or method called 
perform bounce concise. So when we're talking about functions or methods, you'll hear different terms for that process of running them. So it might be referred to as calling it or running it or executing it or even invoking it. Uh, but it will do the same thing. So this has packaged it up into a little function for us. Keeps our update easier to manage. Our update is smaller in terms of size. Again, you know, if we were re refactoring code, so refactoring is the process of updating, uh, you know, making improvements to code. I could set it up as a separate function and then have it in parallel. So it allowed you to, it would allow me to try different options very easily because I just comment out one line and put in the other. So grouping things into functions makes that maintaining or working with code easier. And we, again, we go back to Unity just to make sure that I haven't broken everything because um, that would be embarrassing. And it's still working, which is cool. So that's good. But maybe I want to start getting information out of this. So let's start to redesign some of these bits here. I want to have something where what it's doing is it's telling me where we're currently at in the bounce. So I want to have something here that uh, I might call this update bounce progress. So the job of this is to update the time and then to return that updated time back. So what I could do is I could grab these, bring them into here, and then I could return bounce time. So we can grab values and we can bring, send them back. This is how we pass information back from a function. We say that we return that information. Um, so this will this would update the progress and then I could be doing things with it. This is probably not the most useful way of actually setting this up though, because we're already, we're messing with variables we've already got. I'm going to change this to, this is going to be get height offset. So I think that's going to be a more useful thing because that we can take our animation curve and do this. So get the current value of the bounce curve. And then I'm going to take that and multiply that by bounce height. So this gives us our height offset. So as I said, when we are working with functions, we can return. A return is how we actually say, yep, pass a value back. Now, really important thing. If I put a debug log here, this will never run. And it won't. A return causes an immediate exit from the function. If you put a return there, it will not run any code after it in the function. And that can actually be a really handy thing. We can use that as a way to turn functions off. If I wanted to turn off the verbose one, I could just do that. Now nothing below that return line in that function will run. So it can be a way of having a function exit early. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. I am going to leave this debug log in here, but I am going to comment up code below never runs because the return forces an immediate exit. An important thing, forces an immediate exit at that stage. So, okay, that's cool. We've got it that we're, you know, grabbing the, the height there and we know that exact value. Because what I could then do is, okay, 
height offset is equal to get height offset. So what will happen is this is run our get height offset function and store the return value in height offset. So important thing with when we're doing this bit of logic here and thing that can really easily trip folks up. This name here has no meaning within that get height offset function. This function cannot see that variable. What happens is effectively get height offset runs and it scribbles down on a bit of paper, here's the value I've returned, and then later that gets transferred into the height offset variable. This function, so the block of code here, does not know what is happening on this side of the equal sign. It can't see it. It has no way of knowing about it. All it does is it runs, stashes the value it's returned in a temporary location, and then afterwards, it will come and store that into here. So, and I actually, inside my get height offset function, I can't even see that variable. So this is where we're getting into an area called scope. So scope determines a lot of different things, but one of the key things is what can see what other things. So a good way to think of these braces is these are actually marking out walls of a room. So this is one room and this is another. And these are, these are thick, solid walls, completely opaque. So unless you have X-ray vision, you can't see from one room into another. The same is true here. We cannot see from this room into this one. We can see the ones outside of it. So we have windows to this area. We can see things that are at a scope uh, outside of our current one, but we can't see what things that are inside a scope that's in another room. Or if we had an area here where we had like an if statement with braces inside of it, can't see in that. It's like it's a sealed box. So these are defining rooms. And you can always see into the things outside of you, but you can't see into uh, boxes that are inside the room and you can't see into other rooms. And I can prove this. If I tried to, you know, we have this variable here. If I tried to do, okay, well, height offset, you are equal to, and you can see autocompletes already trying to tell me, no. Uh, let's make it that. It's immediately like, this doesn't exist. I can't see this. So this name does not matter. The name here could quite literally be, well, without the semicolons. It's the problem when I do that, I end up, always end up adding in semicolons. So it could be that, you know, it could look like, actually probably not a very secure password, uh, but that that's fine because this function doesn't care. So what we store the things into, the name of it doesn't matter. The name is for our use, but I could retrieve that height offset. And, you know, I could check, okay, well, if that height offset is equal to zero, um, let's maybe give it a little bit of a leeway if it is less than or equal to 0 0.01, then, you know, let's put out a message, boing. So as they hit the, the lowest point, they'll just display that message. So I could put that into here, but this is a case where there might be, I might be using this in multiple different locations. So, okay, that, that should do the trick, but again, coming back and testing. Always, always be testing your code. And yep, I will be getting messages about unreachable code. That's because of that return I put in and that's okay. So you can see, um, this is why I'm going to turn collapse back on. Uh, but we're regularly getting the uh, boing messages uh, appearing there, which is good. That's what we want to be able to see. 
So, okay, cool. So we've created a few functions now. We've got our one that returns information. We've got ones that just don't return information, don't take in any inputs. Let's go a little bit further and let's make it that we want to have function that is taking input in. And we want to have a look at how we could actually do that. So let's go for something that let's go all in on this. It takes in input and it also takes it also generates an output. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the uh, output that it generates in this case is going to be a vector 3. So we can pretty much return any type. Uh, so it's going to be a vector 3. I'm going to call this calculate new position. Now I'm going to say that this takes in as an input the height offset. And what it is going to do is update the, well actually it doesn't update the position, it's just going to calculate the new position. So I don't even need to set up another variable here. I can just do this. I can just return and do the calculation in line if I want. So this will calculate a new position. Now again, the names for these parameters only have meaning within the function. They don't mean anything outside of the function. They are tied permanently to this. So this, again, I could have called this all sorts of gibberish. As long as I use the exact same gibberish throughout the function, that's the key thing. But usually good to have the names uh, be something that's explanatory. The other thing I also avoid is I will not have the name be the same as one of the variables declared outside of the function. The reason being is although the behavior is clear of what will happen, so C sharp will use the one that is closest to it. So in other words, it will use the uh, parameter in those cases. It will always use the parameter, but it does make the code ambiguous in that while it's very clear what C-sharp will do, it's not always clear what your intent was. So make sure the names that you use for any variables outside of functions, that you don't use them for parameters. If that means that you have to put in like of an underscore, that's fine, um, but don't use the uh, variable names if they're used outside of here, just to avoid that ambiguity there in the code and any potential uh, issues that that could happen. Not from the point of view of the compiler will, you know, C Sharp will do things you don't expect, but just from the point of view that you might not be realizing what it's supposed to be doing. So we've got a function, it returns a vector three, it's called calculate new position, and it has to take in a height. So I could see how I go about using that. And so I'm just going to modify, let's modify the concise version for now. So I could say that that is equal to calculate new position. And if I did that, if I didn't provide it any parameters, it's going to yell at me. Because it's going to say, well, no, you, you need to give it a high offset. And about 50. If I try and do this and I give it a type that it doesn't recognize, it's going to be grumpy at me because I'm trying to, I've said that this needs to be a floating point number and I've given it a string. Uh, if I tried to give it an integer, that will be fine. So an integer can convert over to a uh, decimal point, a floating point number very easily. So that it won't get cranky at me. Uh, but what I could then do is that'll be curve output times bounce height. And then again, coming back, checking, running. So we want to make sure we're always in this habit. We write code, we save it, we check it, make sure that it's behaving the way that we expect it to, which it is. So functions can take many parameters. Uh, we can provide many, many, many different parameters there. Uh, I could, you know, 
chuck in extra ones here if I wanted to. The key thing is the order matters. And the order matters in the sense of whatever order I list them here, I need to use the same order here. So I'm going to com create a just completely arbitrary function. Uh, so this is going to be a void function. And I'm just going to call this example. And I'm going to make it that it takes in an integer. Uh, example int. I'm going to make it take in a float. Example float. And I'm going to make it take in a string. Example string. And I'm just going to debug log all of those things out. So I'll use this in start. And if I do example, now I was able to pass in a integer for a floating parameter. Can I do the opposite of passing a float in for a integer? And the answer is no, it gets grumpy at me. So I have to actually make sure I pass in the uh, correct type. So the order matters here. This order will must match this order here. So this is expecting first an int, then a float, then a string. And I've provided an int, a float, and then a string. So order matters. I can't omit one of these typically. So if I do example and 73, 52.8, and then you're like, cool, done. No, because it needs to actually have all three parameters. And it's specifically telling me there's, there's no argument there for it that's missing. I can set up default parameters though. So example, with defaults. So the way you specify a default is here where you create the function. So example with defaults, I'll actually be fine with that. Because what will happen is if I don't provide a string, then it uses the uh, default value. And let's make that 42, also 42 and not default. So we can provide default values. That can be really handy. We don't have to do it, but we can. Important thing there is typically, well, actually, no, it's not typically, it's a required thing. If you have multiple parameters with defaults, they always need to go at the end. You can't put a default parameter at the start because otherwise it can be confusing. It can't tell what you're actually emitting there. So default parameters always at the end. So let's try that. Let's see what is happening here then. So we can run this and we should see a whole bunch of our different outputs. And we are, we've got our first set of ones. We've got our second set where it's saying not default and then our final set with defaults. So functions, we can give them default values there. So it's a really handy way of working with stuff. So, okay, let's, let's recap a bunch of stuff here with functions. Functions are a way of grouping code. We use them to create logical blocks of code. And we do that to do a couple of things. Part of the reasons we do that is to create a reusable block so that we can use that in multiple different cases. The other reason we do that is to take large complex sections and split them up into smaller areas so that they're easier to maintain and we have less potential uh, avenue for bugs. So making it more modular does make it easier and safer to work with. So that's why we use functions. In terms of what functions have to have, function must have a name. That's an essential thing. And they follow the same rule as naming for variables for the files. You can use letters, you can use an underscore, you can use numbers, but numbers need to go, uh, can't be the first character. So that's the key thing there. They have to have a name. 
they have to have an indication of what they return. Even if that is nothing, if a function is returning nothing ever, then we make it void. A void is a way of saying this function does not return anything. It will never return anything. So functions have a return type. They have a name. They also can have parameters. So they either do or don't have parameters. Uh, parameters are a way of passing information in to a function. And we can pass as many different things in as we want. Uh, so we can pass information into a function and we can get information out through that return type. In terms of how those things look then. So function name, to the left of the function name is its type. And in particular, its return type. Within the parentheses is where we indicate the parameters, the information that that function needs to run. The name of those parameters only has meaning within the function itself. Doesn't have meaning outside of the function. That name, we want to avoid using names of any variables outside of the function just to avoid ambiguity when we are looking at the code. C Sharp will do, a spit, will, not, will do the exact same thing very consistently, but we might not, and we can make mistakes there. So we want to avoid that potential error. So the names only have relevance within the function. When we are passing information back, we do that by saying return, and then we give the value. When return runs, no code after that will actually run in that function. Return forces an immediate exit of the function at that point. So return is how we get information back, which we can then store in variables, which we saw up here, uh, where we are running that get height offset function, and then we are storing it in a variable. So generally, when we're running functions that return stuff, we, we're storing it, we're checking it, we're doing something with it at that stage. So, okay, we've got information being returned, got information being passed in. We saw the idea of scope where these braces define rooms, and we can see into rooms outside of our current one, but we can't see into rooms that are at the same level, on the same floor as us or a room that is within our area, a box in our room. We cannot see inside that box. And that's something called scope. So those are the key things we need to be keeping in mind when we're working with functions. Now it is a lot to process. And you early on, that idea of, well, how do I split this up into a function? You might make the wrong call with it. And that's okay. It doesn't matter. You're not going to break stuff with that. And you're going to run into errors and that's okay. And early on, you might make the wrong call of like, okay, making this a function has actually just made it worse. It's made it more, made it more verbose. That's okay. That's part of how we actually learn from this is by running into mistakes like that, by running into issues, and then we find ways of making them better and of fixing them. So experiment with these functions, take the setup here and Try and build those functions yourself from scratch. So you could take some notes down of, okay, I want a function that just does the bouncing. And then try and build that. You could build initially the version where it's doing everything in update. So you could have that version and then try and build these functions yourself. Have a go with that. Have a go with trying to set up just a function that's just logging out information even is a useful thing to be doing but experiment with the code and practice it. That's the key thing there that you need to be doing. Um, and don't be afraid of running into errors. Remember, we wanna run into as many errors as we can as fast as we can. That's how we get better at this. That's the key there. Uh, so run into errors, experiment with it, try dividing up the code in ways that feel like it makes sense for you. Um, what matters, especially at this stage, is that your code functions and if that requires some horrendously hacky stuff there for getting it to run, great, it runs. That's the key thing to be focusing on at the moment. 
Thanks folks, that is all for this video. If you're looking for the project, you'll be able to find it up on GitHub, and I've put a link to that in the description below. If you've got any feedback, any questions, please chuck in a comment. And if you're looking to find ways to support the channel, chucking in a like or subscribing to the channel is always a big help. If you're looking to go further than that, then I do have a Patreon set up and any support there is super appreciated. And there's a bunch of different things that you're, you'll get as part of being a, a patron there. And the big thing is it's going to help me make more cool things like this, which is going to help more people uh, like yourself to be making more games, which is awesome. And that is, that, is, that is all for now. Thank you.